Welcome to chapter 8 in services marketing. We're coming up to one of the really interesting parts of services and one of the areas that's probably the most applicable for you even if you don't go on to be a services marketer is if you work in a professional context, you work in a professional environment providing your skills, you are probably going to be able to make use of some of the uh, elements of this chapter particularly now that we're looking at here the service design service standards gap so we're looking at the three elements here of the customer driven standards and the management perception of customer expectations how do we match the two so we've got the three elements the service design customer driven standards and the service scape so what I want to talk about in this slide deck is service innovation and service design and I'll freely say this is one of the areas I think some of the most fun you can have in services marketing, both in practice and at the conceptual level. Because what you're going to do is you're going to look at actually developing a service blueprint. And this is where you're going to say, what are the components? What are the procedures and processes that I need to undertake? What are the structures that need to be there to support me? in order to create a service, in order to deliver this service, and to have the customer get the best satisfaction from the whole process. So what we're going to look at, briefly touch on the service innovation, but really this is about service design. And the first thing I'm going to say is that one of the challenges we have in services marketing is that services are experiential. So they're internalized. They happen to you and you happen to them as well. So there's this exchange process where you are engaged in the creation of a service, how you contribute can shape how the service turns out. So when we come to describe it as a set of words, we do risk oversimplification. We do risk trying to bring down a complicated, nuanced and rich experience into 25 words or 250 words for an assignment question. We're always going, it's always going to be incomplete. We'll never quite capture the essence of a service because the essence of the service happens internally. And there's always that filter mechanism between what you have in your head and what you're able to say on a page. The subjectivity, a great service for me can be a poor service for you, a great and movies are a fabulous area where people can have professional movie watchers, critics can go, this is the best movie ever, and the general public goes, I don't know why I'm watching this, because our frameworks, our subjectivity, and it's supposed to be subjective. There is a certain level of objectivity, but quite often services are about the subjective experience, about the nuance that you bring of your own interpretation. And that area, yeah, it's also biased. You are very biased. Everyone is. The world has its own biases. We like confirmation of our own beliefs. We like a service. We go into a service, and if we go into the service expecting to have a bad day, we like to be right, so we'll have a bad service. It doesn't always matter what happens. It can be exacerbated, but if you've gone in, to a service, like this stupid day, not happy, don't like anything, stupid coffee's gonna taste foul because it's stupid. There is not a lot that coffee has as a chance. But knowing as we know from service recovery, if that coffee is just moderately better than you're expecting, it could turn your whole day around. So we got a whole bunch of aspects here that services, we have to describe them in words, but they're not words aren't always the best way but we don't have any other um, option at the moment. So let's talk about how we're going to go build a service. First thing you need to be considering is that in services marketing, in this chapter, we're going to be a little bit biased towards new service and creation of new services. But service innovations are that aspect of improving an existing performance so you don't have to create an entirely new service you can just enhance what already exists 
And there are a couple of ways. There's the customers, there's the employees, the frontline staff. We've talked about them in market research as the fonts of information. We also have the concepts of the service design thinking, and there's a lot of stuff on user experience and user interface. So there's a lot of material that exists that's worth looking at. In fact, if you want to get outside the services marketing family here, look at user experience. Look at the UX literature and see what they're looking at in terms of their designs, their techniques, their critical thinking, their ways to appraise and approach service development. So for service design thinking, you're looking at five areas. I would say out of this, they're all important, which is the bad news for you. But how you use something like five principles of service design thinking is that you look at the overlap and the way that they can enhance each other. So we have co-creation. The stakeholders need to, the people who are going to be involved in the delivery. So if you have got this design for an amazing service, but you haven't spoken to the staff who are going to be responsible for delivering it, you're failing at the outset. You've got to bring customers and employees along for the ride because they will be doing this together. You should be thinking in terms of what is the experience that, the, that we are going to deliver to the customer, so the user-centric element. You will also need to consider what are our limits in terms of what we can provide, but you want to be thinking, well, what is it the customer wants? What can we give them? To do the design, sequencing and evidencing are really important. What are the actions? What are the processes? What's the procedural components? What are the elements? What needs to happen first, second, third, however many more steps there are, and last? What is the evidence that service is underway or has taken place? And evidence comes back to service scape. Evidence comes back to addressing intangibility. And the fifth point of service design thinking is that you need to be looking at this as a holistic design. A services product is not a single unit. A services product sits within a series of behaviors. So you want to look at the whole of the environment because the whole of the environment will influence perception of the service. You want to be ensuring that you're covering all of the touch points, all of the critical incidents, all of the key points that the customer can see as well as interact. So if you come to my restaurant and I have a glass wall to the kitchen, the chefs and the serving staff need to know that they are performers. It's not just enough to be creating the food, a little bit of flair in the cooking, a little bit of an excessive wok toss, a little bit of sudden burst of flames from the grill adds to the ambience. It's a holistic part, it's part of the evidence, and it needs to be incorporated in the design. So what do we talk about when we talk about service innovations? We talk about a couple of things. Top of the list is the radical innovation, the brand new product, the never before seen service. Through to services that already exist and augmentation enhancements. We already had taxi services, so a new taxi company, a self-driven taxi company, the Google self-driving car. They're all spectrum across. The self Google self-driving car gets to start administering taxi services. The London cabbies are going to beat that thing hands down because the knowledge, the qualification you need to be a black cab driver in the uh, London taxi ranks is you need to know about the local environment. So if people ask you a question, they can you can field local knowledge. So this is what you're looking at as then it becomes, that's a new service. Premium taxi, you have basic taxi, which is point A to point B. Premium taxi, point A to point B with additional information available along the way. So a tour guide taxi. And these are where you start looking at things like service line extensions or service improvements. So one of the innovations that you can actually have in services marketing is an improvement to the service. And that can be front end or back end. 
Now, as it happens, for this semester, one of the things that we're doing in terms of service innovations are these pre-recorded lectures. It may not be an innovation to a flipped classroom. It's not an innovation but in any sense of the word because we're doing flipped classrooms in a variety of places, a variety of universities. Given this is only the second offering of postgraduate services marketing in the last five years, this is a service improvement in terms of changing the dynamic or changing the product offering so that you can pre-access this material so we can have the conversation in the classroom rather than sitting and listening to a monologue. So we have service design. So coming through in terms of what is an innovation? An innovation is doing something new, radically new through to enhancements that, are diff that make the service different from what it was previously. What I want to do here is I want to point you to the text. This is a good chapter to really get into the textbook because there's a lot of stuff in here that are marketing processes. If you've done introduction to marketing or your marketing strategy, new product development, this is an area that you should be familiar with, particularly marketing strategy. You should have seen this a couple of times. So rather than me talk over it, I'm going to ask you to read it. And it's an area where if you are interested, there's a lot of resources. This is one, get out and get your hands on as much of the new product development literature as you can acquire through Google Scholar and the library databases whilst you're on our IP range. A lot of good material has been written in this area. Really encourage you, if you do want to set up your own company, you do want to get into service design, or you want to be a service consultant, it's a great area. So this is the ANSOF matrix. Uh, this is an absolute stable, uh, sorry, absolute staple of marketing strategy. It asks you the question of, do you have a current service? Yes, no. Do you have current customers? Yes, no. If you already have a customer and you have a service, to grow your offering, you can get them to use the service more frequently so you can buy a bigger, you're looking at building a share of, or a larger share of that market. If you currently have a service and you want to attract new customers, you're doing market development. You're making your service attractive to a different group of customers. If you're ready, if you want to grow through an alternative approach, that's to say, I already have customers, what else can I offer them? You're looking at service development, product development, you create a new service and offer it to the people who you already address, and you have the service development approach. And finally, if you don't have customers and you haven't offered a service before, welcome to diversification, and this is playing business on difficult. Diversification requires you to explain to a new group of people who have no dealings with you a new product. So that is one of the hardest things you can do in business, and that's how every startup effectively begins. They have no customers, and their product has never existed. And it's the hardest thing you can do. So if you get the opportunity to work in a company where you get to do market development, product service development first, that's a lot, that's a lot of good skills you're going to get. If you can work in those two fields first before you hit diversification, that's a really good grounding. A lot of people try and go straight to diversification, which makes it really tough. All right, let's talk about service blueprints. This is going to be the capstone for this chapter. Service blueprinting is a visualization tool. It creates models of services. And these aren't statistical models. These aren't testable models per se. These are ways of seeing the world. Because what you're looking for is, what is the process? What is the flow of performance in the service? Where are the points of interaction? Referred to here as the points of contact. And what evidence exists of the presence of the service? So we build a basic framework, which is the customer who has a line of interaction with the visible contact employees. The visible contact employees have the line of visibility. When they step behind the curtain, the customer can no longer see them. 
So you have the invisible contact employees. They also then have an internal interaction with the processes and the support procedures. Textbook is going to cover this in detail. There's a couple of examples to work through in the text, so I really want you to go look at that. Because what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to create a diagram that looks basically like a flowchart. So you have the lines of interaction, external and internal, the line of visibility. So on something like an express mail delivery service, the physical evidence is the truck, the delivery truck, the packaging. Amazon put a lot of effort into those boxes that they deliver, not just for the costs and the logistics, but also they are a visual representation of the Amazon experience. They are servicescape product, packaging, and brand all in one. What are the touch points between a courier delivery? There's the customer gives package to driver, driver gives package to customer. So you've got personal interaction, human interaction, touch points. You've got invisible interaction, and then you've got support processes behind the scenes. Getting product from point A to point Z through the rest of the alphabet and several numerical uh, waypoints, all of which we don't see, but what we instead experience is the total outcome. So we set a, as a service promise, it will be there in seven days from wherever in the world you have ordered the pickup, it will go to somewhere else in the world for the delivery in less than seven days. The support processes are the enabler to let us keep our promise. So there's a lot of work been done in service blueprinting. It's a really useful area. It's really worth putting some time and effort into exploring if you want to run your own service or you want to design and enhance the service that you're working for. So what are the benefits of the service blueprint process? And this is the point where I'm going to, uh, again, emphasize, go back to the chapter for this. Overall, what the Service Blueprint does is that it actually codifies and makes tangible the plan of the service process. So you sit down and you document and you write out and you think through each of the stages, each of the steps, each of the component elements of what makes up your service. So you're starting to actually create a model for which you can use to go looking for the services gaps. You can also then look at this from the point of view of, well, what is happening in our processes? What can we do that distinguishes us from our competitors? Where are our opportunities for innovation? What happens when we change one of the wires? What happens if we change the points of interaction or the point of visibility? What happens if we move the curtain forward? So for package delivery, you go to a waypoint you put a box, you go, there's a console, you put a box, everything's automated, box goes on, scales, box gets weighed, measured, labeled automatically and shifted off and you don't deal with the person. Does that give us an enhancement or an advantage? Or does having the person reassure you, yes, your fragile package will go somewhere important. Look at me, watch me take care of your package from point A to point B as an exhibition of how we will care, we're showing you from front counter to uh, backstage that yes, these are important to us, that your goods are important to us. So there are ways in which you want to be able to look at the blueprint and say, what can we do to enhance the message, the image, and the communication that we are having with the customer through the way the service is implemented? So what we'll do uh, when the opportunity presents itself to have a discussion around this is actually go and try and build a couple of service blueprints. So I'd recommend you go and look at this section of the text and go off and give it a go. Run through the six steps, look at it from a service delivery, from a point of view of, as a customer, what would I see? As a service provider, what do I want the customer to see? So that wraps the chapter for chapter eight and welcome aboard the second provider gap where we start looking at it very much from the customer from the point of view of the company saying what does the customer 
What do we need to do to engage the customer? What do we know of the customer and how do we implement? As always, if you need me, email me, stephen.danamu.edu.au or contact me across Twitter. And that's a wrap for the chapter.